Uh, hello, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me, those who have already attended. And I presume there will be a lot of other participants coming in. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. And welcome to our fifth weekly webinar organized by One Health Bangladesh in partnership with Global Health Development. As you know, this time, uh, you know, we are technically connected, but socially uh, very distant. And I have seen a lot of participants, not only from Bangladesh, we have a quite a good number of participants from other parts of the world, including South Asia and other countries, and also from Africa. And uh, a very a warm welcome to all of them in this uh, particular webinar. Uh, as you all know, that this time we will be talking about the effectiveness of One Health platforms for pandemic preparedness and response, lesson learned from ongoing pandemics. This is the topic that we will be discussing today. And we have very, two very distinguished uh, speakers, and Bangladesh One Health community uh, knows both of them. Uh, Professor Doug Pfeiffer, uh, Chair of One Health, uh, a Center for Applied One Health Research and Policy, and also Professor in the Department of Infectious Disease and Public Health in Hong Kong University. More importantly, he is very connected with Bangladesh. He has been attending our One Health Conference uh, for a long time, I think uh, quite a good number of conferences he attended. He is connected with us with a research program, which is also very One Health focused. He has some students in Bangladesh as well, as still mentoring them. And uh, that a very uh, kind of you to accept our invitation to be here with us today. We have uh, another speaker, uh, Professor Mustaq Choudhury. He is very much known to our Bangladesh colleagues. He is the advisor and founding dean of Brack uh, James Gann School of Public Health, Brack University. He is a member of the management advisory group of the director general of FAO. More importantly, you know, personally he was involved with implementing a One Health project, what we call Mekong um, uh, Basin uh, surveillance network. He might be sharing some of those experiences today. And uh, he has uh, very actively involved still now with Brack as well as with a lot of other activities uh, related to agriculture and public health. So I welcome both of these uh, uh, speakers today. Uh, before we go to the uh, session, I just have a few announcements. As you all know, it will be an hour, one hour long session. All participants can put their written question uh, in the uh, question and answer box. You can see at the bottom of your um, computer. And you can also write your name, uh, introduce yourself in chat box. Um, but that is not the question and answer. We'll take the question and answer from the question and answer box. <laughs> And the program will be recorded and it will be uploaded in One Health Bangladesh website as well as uh, in the um, uh, uh, Global Health website, Global Health Development website. With these few words, we'll go for the uh, session now and I will request Professor Doug Pfeiffer start uh, uh, the presentation. And both of them will have a presentation and then we'll go for question and answer. Professor Doug Pfeiffer, please. Okay, thank you, Niki. Let me see whether I can actually handle the technology. So let's go to the application. Um, and I'll... Yeah, is, you can... Is the yeah. presentation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So now for what I've got here, I've got basically the, the title of today's webinar. And uh, what I will do is I will talk about my, I guess my reflections during the, um, I guess when from the start of this, of this when it wasn't really a pandemic at the beginning to, to where we are now and where 
uh, One Health fits in and how science and policy have interacted during that time. And I'll start off with um, just talking a little bit about the context, a couple of slides, and then briefly remind us about interdisciplinary research in One Health, and then I have several slides to, with some ideas for policy development, how we could actually maybe make it more effective and more appropriate, tailored to these uh, types of challenges. And then I'll finish off with a, one slide just with some conclusions. So in terms of context, and I mean, this is about food. I mean, uh, um, I guess COVID is also about food. It, it, uh, the, the current hypothesis still is that it started off in a wet market. Uh, so there is a food connection here and that the source animals uh, are connected to the food system. Um, I am showing this slide just to emphasize complexity, uh, and that'll be the threat throughout my presentation. We are um, living in complex systems, and the challenges that we're dealing with, I need to acknowledge that. And I think the, the, the current mechanisms that we have for policy development aren't really suited to that. So when you look at that system here, you've got the consumers in one end, you've got the farmers, and you've got lots of other actors in between. But you've also got the different, um, I guess, dimensions like you can see up here, we've got science, technology, governance, you've got uh, environment, uh, you've got economics, uh, you've got cultural factors, etc. So, so this is really, I guess, what One Health is about. I mean, recognizing the holistic or the fact that we need to use holistic approaches to, to deal with um, infectious diseases that are emerging from such complex systems. Another more detailed example is when we look at infectious emergence of infectious pathogens in food systems in, in, in South, Southeast and uh, East Asia. Uh, and what, so what we've got here at the bottom is we've got the, um, the households, we've got some um, companion animals in that context, and a lot of consumers will buy, depending on where you are, which country you're in, uh, a lot of consumers buy from supermarkets and in other countries they buy from wet markets. Um, so what, what we have here, we've got some intensive farms that are connected to these supermarkets. Um, and on the other channel is through wet markets where we might have backyard farms, small scale farms in the, in the background. And we may have a quite an intensive trade network um, for the livestock that's being kept by the backyard and small scale farms. And each of those two systems, they represent particular challenges and add to the common or represent quite complex systems. But in, on top of that, you might also have cultural activities like uh, fighting cock activities in some um, countries in the region here. Uh, you've got oh, wild birds playing a role, contributing um, to, to, to the process. And you've got, you might have wild animals, which is the, the, the yeah. Yeah. Which is the situation here, um, in, in, in which we are um, suspecting to be one of the reasons for the emergence of COVID-19. Why are these animals being traded uh, through wet markets? Now, if you are, um, yeah, and there are also some connections between the backyard farms and the more intensive farms, and that may be because um, some of the employers, they maybe have, maybe have a farm at home where they keep some chickens, keep some pigs, depending on what country you're in. Um, now, if you take the wild animal reservoirs, whether that is uh, um, wild birds for avian influenza or it's um, other um, pathogens for such as SARS uh, and, and the COVID uh, situation at the moment, um, we probably have these introductions occurring a lot of the time, but uh, most of the time, it doesn't lead, they are not infectious to humans, um, or it just doesn't, there isn't enough multiplication occurring within those wet markets. So these wet markets present an opportunity for amplification um, of these pathogens. And there's trade between the wet markets, so again, it can keep, there's a cycle that keeps going. Um, this is, I guess, the, um, I mean, the angle of uh, um, avian influenza uh, through the backyard farming system. And um, there may now be also a, 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 a spillover into the intensive farms, which if the biosecurity isn't effective, they are um, provide a mechanism for quite big substantial outbreaks. Although we need to, we, obviously these farms is not in their economic interest to have these outbreaks. So they will 
usually invest heavily into very good biosecurity, but because they have such large numbers of elements, any introduction has quite disastrous health and economic effects, and they might also then seed that infection through the food system. So, so that's kind of a, the background. You've got a very complicated system with lots of interconnections. And this isn't just a, I mean, one example of all the different actors which are in, involved in this system. And um, we've got the industry in the middle here. We've got uh, those which are looking after um, ways of or thinking about ways how you can manage the system, how you control disease. And that also includes scientists and, and includes government and also industry lobby groups. But the action really has to occur in the middle here, which is where we've got the consumers that are driving the system to uh, what they, their preferences that they have in terms of consumption. And then you've got the um, value chain and the supply chain within the food system that provides opportunities for emergence of these uh, risks. And that also applies to COVID-19, given that that sits somewhere in the background, although well, the, the current hypothesis is still, it's a wild uh, animal source and maybe wild animal farming or direct uh, sales of wild animals, infected wild animals in, in markets. We do have uh, quite good knowledge about what you have to do in order to mitigate those risks, to control the risks, um, uh, uh, but they're not, it's really a question of compliance and whether it's in the economic interest of those actors in the system to actually adopt those risk mitigation measures. And then there's some various other issues in terms of um, who's actually benefiting, who's making money from it, um, the acceptance and the, I guess the policy development or, or the, the, the risk management um, uh, activities. Okay, now just a few slides on um, two slides on interdisciplinary research. That what you, what I just showed you is all complexity. We have to um, acknowledge the interaction between people, the environment, and animals, which is what One Health is about. And we need to use an integrated approach to deal with that. And and we're not really used to that. We are very good at conducting high quality science uh, within particular scientific disciplines, but to actually integrate. In fact, even coming up with integrated or holistic questions is quite difficult, but then to actually integrate knowledge, scientific knowledge is uh, uh, quite difficult. And this is just an example here where I've, I've been taking it a bit further. And when you think of COVID, I mean, a lot of it is about m the medicine, the medical side of things up here. Um, we have social science there, which is about human behavior. Uh, but, and, and what I wanted to emphasize is there's also an ethical issue in here when it comes to questions about what should you prioritize in terms of an intervention activity. Is it all about saving humans li human lives uh, which are threatened by the pathogen? What about questions such as mental health uh, which may be compromised as a consequence of the lockdown uh, procedures? What about uh, the, 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 the inequality that the people which are in the higher income um, categories, they find it easier to deal with lockdown and also are maybe less likely to lose their jobs and their income than people are that are in the lower income categories. And then there are also uh, issues in relation to personal freedom where, where lockdown uh, interventions are quite dramatic really, including um, when it comes to not being able to travel, um, leave the country, come back in, and whether you have to get tested or not, etc. So lots of questions that need to be addressed. And looking at COVID, a lot of it is dominated actually by the medical perspective of the issue. Okay, so so what that brings me to is really is for me the term risk governance is really important here, um, and because the policy happens within that system, so there's a a framework for risk governance. There are institutions that are all involved in risk governance. And classically, we have this vision of we have scientific research, we generate knowledge, and then on the basis of that, we develop policies and they're being communicated. Um, and that's a very simplistic perspective, uh, and which is why it's also called the technocratic model for policy development. In the real world, it, seems much, it, looks, it looks, looks much more uh, complex. And this is uh, something that I've used in many presentations. And it's actually not 
um, adequate when you look at, even that is not adequate for a situation that we're in now. So you've got the policymakers that are um, dealing with a risk and they have to come up with decisions about what is the most effective way of mitigating that risk. And you can ask the question, what is the risk actually? Is the risk of the economy um, as a consequence of the intentions, uh, interventions is actually uh, ending up in trouble? Is it about saving humans li human lives because of uh, COVID-19? Is it about and minimizing the risk of people committing suicide, etc. So there are lots of different risks that you need to consider. Um, when I looked at those slides, I usually just thought about, okay, I want to control a disease, an infectious disease. That, that's the risk that I'm interested in. And actually recognizing less uh, the importance of the impact of those interventions on, on other, or, or, or the impact on other dimensions of the issue. So policy measures, and they ha do they have an impact? And the question is, uh, what works and what doesn't work? And we use risk assessment, we use scientific knowledge to come up with uh, what is, uh, might be the best way of dealing with that particular threat. And there's a lot of uncertainty, um, usually with most of these threats, and we know that from COVID-19, we know that from other infectious diseases, there's a lot that we do not know, and therefore the policymakers need to be able to cope with that uh, fact. Um, now, that's the space that I work in, and the trouble is that there are lots of other factors that influence the flexibility that policymakers has, have to do to develop policies, and that's whether they've got enough resources, whether that's staff, whether that's uh, financial, whether the le legislation is there, the different institutions which are involved in, in defining the policies, and then there's also that, 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 that social science dimension here, whether uh, society is actually what they think is important. Um, are the risks that the policymakers are trying to deal with, are they the most important ones for society? Or are there particular stakeholder groups that are uh, interested in, or I, I would not want to um, adopt the measures that are uh, being proposed by the policymakers. So these are the kinds of things that need to be um, Consider, but I have to say that is still incredibly simplistic. Um, so now I, I've actually in the last couple of years, I mean, I can't, I'm, in fact, this was uh, um, this concept of risk governance was by the International Risk Governance Council and developed this, and I felt it actually really fits what we are uh, uh, looking at here. So at the center of it sits communication. I have to have effective communication. Uh, in, in the country between the different stakeholders. I need to know who the stakeholders are and what their priorities are. I need to be able to frame the risk clearly. I need to uh, de describe the risk in its socioeconomic context. I need to be able to assess the risk. So that's the bit that I have to do with often, that's scientific assessment, but it also is about expressing complexity. And when I look at a, an infectious disease, I tend to look at it in a very simplistic way because I focus on the biological aspects of the disease risk. I'm not really uh, looking at the social aspects of those diseases, which is what we need to include when we are, want to develop, or when we firstly want to evaluate the risk, whether it's uh, a risk that we, is, we need to do something about, and then also what kind of uh, mechanisms we use to manage the risk. So um, the this really requires a one health approach. It goes even beyond just uh, thinking about human uh, um, animal and environmental health. We need to add the social sciences, we need to add ethics, etc., in various other areas. And this is a uh, um, um, colleagues from uh, uh, also from RBC involved here who um, have actually looked at this uh, same question the integration of knowledge from the different perspectives defining, framing the question very clearly, and uh, then coming up with, uh, up here, resolving trade-offs, what's actually cost benefits, okay? Uh, so it's not just economic, but also social benefits and costs need to be taken into account. Incredibly challenging when you think about it. But uh, um, uh, that, that, that is to me where the institutionalization of One Health has to lead. And I want to just finish that uh, um, aspect here on Quite frankly, the sustainable development goals, they're expressing a lot of this. They're looking at the different dimensions that we need to consider when we're dealing with uh, um, threats to the planet, 
but even if we're just looking at infectious diseases, we can um, get a reminder of being reminded what is important. And it's not just human health. There are lots of other factors with them that we have to consider. So just finishing off with one slide of conclusions, which is trying, and I've added a few bits in that slide also. So number one, pretty obvious, highly complex systems, highly interconnected, and COVID-19 demonstrated that. That thing just went around the planet. Um, it should have been obvious, but uh, uh, and one could have predicted it right at the beginning, but still though, many countries didn't respond or prepare adequately. We have eco-social systems that are changing so rapidly um, so, and, and the COVID impact will result in different changes that we can't even anticipate at this stage. We, will we still have increasing urbanization? I think we will actually, we, will, we still will. Um, increasing demand for food and uh, with economic development incl including, that also includes meat, which creates its own problems in relation to intensification of livestock production. Now, coming to the next thing. So the, from my perspective, we need to, we need to call for unborn health care risk governance. And uh, that means in, you need to understand what, what are the stakeholders that we need to engage when we are developing one health policies. No question, research needs to be interdisciplinary. And, and I think we're getting there slowly. Where, we are, in my view, we are not quite there yet is the policy uh, side of things, which has to be only holistic and inclusive. And I wonder why that is also uh, because of the way how government institutions are structured. Um, that makes it often quite difficult to come up with a, a truly interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary policy. So, because these, when they develop the policies, they need to consider lots of dimensions. Think of COVID here, and I just listed a couple of the different dimensions, the human health, mental health, epidemiology of the disease, economic factors, anthropology, law, ethics, very diverse. So you've got a, a, a prime minister uh, sitting there and having to absorb or, or being presented with information or his advisors uh, with information that captures all these different dimensions. The political economy is important. I mean, the role of institutions. What are the institutions that have most of the power? I mean, it's very interesting. You go to different countries. In some countries, the Department of uh, 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 Health has a lot of um, political power. Um, whereas the departments of agriculture have very little power. And it varies between countries, and these things need to be understood. How are these interrelated, these different uh, departments? What are the linkages? How often do they talk to each other? How do often do they discuss policies? How do they, do they have joint policies? We need to be able to just, just look, and I see there's a lot with COVID. COVID is a lot about immediate impact. And I wonder whether, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the answer. Um, I wonder whether we think enough or have enough time to think about the medium term and long term impact of the policies, the interventions which are being developed. They really worry me. I mean, I, I, it's what <laughs> keeps me awake, wondering what will happen in the medium and the long term as a consequence of the intervention that have been implemented to deal with the immediate threat. We need to think locally, and that's within the country locally, then nationally, but regionally and globally. And there's not enough of a global. Um, perspective or, or a coordination of the response. Um, we need to be able to integrate knowledge and prioritize interventions across these different dimensions um, that I've mentioned. And that's incredibly challenging. And I'm, I wouldn't be the person to be able to do that. Um, we need, there are people who are capable of that. And, and my view is that we need to, governments need to learn and improve and train themselves to do this more effectively, this particular function. And one important part of that, and that's my last sentence here, is that we do need independent interdisciplinary scientific advice to government. And they have to be honest brokers of policy alternatives. It's not good if they are issue advocates, if they have a particular agenda. Um, and, and, and I've learned this in Europe and the UK, and I really um, appreciate the function of the chief scientists in the UK in the different uh, uh, government uh, uh, departments. And I experienced myself the value of those interactions. And they are independent, okay? And we also see this at the moment in the COVID response as it is being run now, that the chief scientific advisors are there together with uh, the political um, uh, um, people, i.e. the prime minister in particular. Um, and we need to get, get that balance right. And, and I think governments need to get used to 
communicating with scientists on a regular basis. It's not something that you should only start during emergency. You need to have practice that. Practice that during times, I mean, before the emergency happens. Because otherwise it takes too long until you've worked out how to effectively communicate with other, how to trust each other. Um, and, it, and I would argue that is, even though the UK has its problems with the way how they're handling COVID, but I would have thought that communication side of things uh, is actually working reasonably well. And uh, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. It's an excellent presentation. I think there are a lot of questions you will have to answer, and I'll come back to you later on. And uh, thank you very much. It is really an excellent presentation. Now I would request uh, Professor Choudhury to come up with his presentation. Dr. Mustak Choudhury. And that can mute his one. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pro uh, Professor Devnath. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to One Health Bangladesh and also to Global Development Network. Uh, for inviting me to, to speak to this uh, very important um, uh, webinar. Uh, and in my opinion, there is no better time uh, in history to organize uh, a, a webinar on One Health than, than this time. Uh, we, we know that how, how the world is uh, facing this, this COVID crisis, and, and uh, which includes, of course, Bangladesh. Uh, Uh, let me let me give uh, some context to what I'm going to present. Uh, in uh, in uh, 2008, uh, I moved to Bangkok uh, to to work for the Rockefeller Foundation, as Professor Debnath mentioned in his uh, introductory uh, remarks about me. Uh, and uh, I, I joined the Rockefeller Foundation as the head of their health programs for Asia. And one of the uh, tasks that I was given initially uh, was to work was to work on uh, one of the uh, regional disease surveillance networks, uh, uh, and uh, which was originally funded by the Rockefeller Foundation back in 2000. Uh, and uh, the foundation was thinking of winding down its support to the uh, network because it had already supported for 10 years. Uh, so I was given the responsibility also to, to, to talk to the different parties uh, uh, connected with the, with the uh, network and, and see how to, how to sort of uh, 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 wind down the uh, Rockefeller support to uh, the, 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 uh, 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 the network. Uh, the network that I'm talking about is called the Mekong Basin Disease Surveillance. Uh, which is widely known as MBDS, uh, and it was set up in 2001, uh, and uh, uh, it is it, it was the first of its kind in the world, where where where, where a, a kind of a network of countries uh, was formed to 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 sort of do surveillance on uh, particularly infectious diseases. Yeah. Uh, so Mr. so. Chaudhary, your screen is not coming yet. No, I'm I'm. I'm Okay. I, I haven't started yet. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I, I, I got so impressed with the with the um, uh, Mekong Basin disease surveillance uh, uh, that 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 I started thinking about why not uh, we uh, set up a similar um, uh, um, uh, network for South Asia. So, what I'm going to do today uh, is to talk about the MBDS. Uh, how it was started and what, what it does and what are the impacts of that uh, and also uh, express my anguish uh, at why we are not being able to do a similar thing in uh, South Asia. So I will now uh, move to uh, uh, my, my presentation uh, and uh, where is that? Yes. So, so the, uh, the, 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 the network is called the MBDS, and uh, it is around uh, uh, in, uh, in the countries uh, which, are, which, are, which are serviced by the uh, Mekong River. As you can see in the map, 
the Mekong starts uh, in, in China uh, and goes through Myanmar, Lao PDR, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and, and then um, uh, sort of uh, culminates into the South China Sea uh, through Vietnam. So, so it, it, it covers six countries and uh, Mekong is one of the longest rivers uh, in the world, which was uh, started in uh, Lhasa Gongyang uh, Spring in, in, in China. Uh, it, the, the river is, is, is a lifeline to, to millions of people in these, in these countries. Uh, in these countries. Uh, so so this, the, uh, the MBDS, as I said, there was uh, started in 2001, and it was originally supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. But now, as you can see in the bottom, there are, there are so many organizations which are supporting uh, the, the network now. Uh, so, so it, as, as I said, it was started in 2001, and here are, uh, uh, is a picture of the six uh, health ministers of these of the six countries: China, uh, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, uh, Lao PDR, Cambodia, and Vietnam, uh, also who signed the initial uh, agreement to start the MBDS. So, so the, the, this is how it it, it started. Uh, there, there are seven uh, interrelated core strategies of MBDS, uh, which includes uh, the, the animal-human interface, uh, uh, which is the zoonosis or, or kind of one health. Uh, the, the second is the community-based surveillance, which is, which, which is done by the MBDS. Uh, the third is the risk communication between the countries. The fourth is the policy research that uh, the, the MBDS does on different policy related issues. The, 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 uh, uh, the fifth is the, the ICD, the, the use of the uh, uh, ICT technologies uh, in, in, this, in the surveillance. And, and, and the sixth one is the uh, 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 building capacities in the laboratories. And the seventh one, but, but not the least, but probably the most important one is the cross-border cooperation. And uh, uh, there are 25 cross-border sites, uh, which, is, which is under, under, under the MBDS. And, and as you can see that uh, is, is, uh, the numbers are 1 to 25. The one means that the, uh, there's the first site which was started. It was started in 2003 between Laos and Thailand. And gradually it included uh, uh, the, uh, the cross-border sites between all the six countries uh, and, and, and that's the main sort of a, a, a lifeline and the, and, the, and, the, and the main focus of the, of the BDS. Uh, the purpose of these sites is to uh, exchange information between the countries, between these, uh, with, uh, uh, between the sites. And, and these are done uh, on a kind of a uh, uh, immediate basis. If there is a uh, outbreak, then, then within 24 hours, this is in, uh, informed to the national government and to the uh, uh, neighboring countries. And then, and then after that, uh, every Monday of the week and every fifth uh, day of the week, each, each week, and, and then every, every quarterly, uh, these, these, these information are shared uh, 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 within the country as well as the other partner countries. Uh, another task that uh, the MBDS does is the tabletop exercise in order to prepare for any 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 coming uh, 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 pandi uh, pandemic. In 2006, for example, they uh, held this this uh, 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 pandemic influenza tabletop ex exercise in all the six countries, uh, and and. Uh, and as you can see, that that uh, that uh, uh, those were held uh, uh, quite religiously in all these countries in in order to uh, arouse uh, uh, awareness and also to get uh, the countries prepared for any eventualities in terms of uh, a new infection. Uh, the the other thing that it does it uh, it is sort of a. a, a works in communication. So, so, so here are different kind of posters that have been uh, developed by MBDS on biosafety and biosecurity, uh, the different procedures that have to be uh, used in, 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 in such, such things. 
uh, and these are translated into into uh, uh, different languages: the, the the Cambodian language, the Lao language, the Myanmar language, Vietnamese language, and, and Thai, and, and so on, and uh, and also the Vietnamese. Uh, so uh, uh, so that the the things that are developed uh, centrally uh, is also sort of shared and and uh, and understood in every country. Uh, the other thing that uh, that it does is the is the joint outbreak investigation. So when there is an outbreak in any country, uh, the the, uh, the health officials uh, uh, in that particular site informs his or her counterpart in the in the neighboring countries, and they together do the uh, outbreak investigation. And then, uh, they, based on the on the on the on the outcome of the investigation, they inform the, their national government and also the other 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 countries of the of the MBTS network. Uh, so, the other thing that uh, that uh, that uh, the MBTS does is, is to organize uh, regional forums. So every year they have these. Uh, 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 regional forums, which which which, which is done in in the in in um, uh, in the countries. So 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 the so the chairmanship of the of the of the MBDS is is sort of rotated between the six countries, and uh, the, this particular one was in China, and you can you can you can identify uh, uh, the the speaker. Uh, of uh, 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 who is the only person who is not wearing a tie? Uh, so, uh, so this uh, this is another picture of the MBDS regional forum, which was done in in Lao PDR. Uh, then, uh, in uh, as I said, that uh, one of my tasks was to was to was to uh, uh, think about the future of MBDS when I joined the Rockefeller Foundation, and and uh, uh, previous to my joining, the 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 MBDS was run on a kind of a uh, agreement between these uh, six countries, and the Rockefeller Foundation was the main donor for that. Uh, but 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 uh, when we thought that if the Rockefeller Foundation withdraws fully, then uh, there may be a problem in the in the continuation of the of the foundation. So we started talking to different uh, uh, partner countries uh, about the about the about the institutional uh, transformation that the MBDS needs, and for that uh, I had to sort of uh, uh, do a lot of shuttle diplomacy between the different capitals, all the six capitals. I had to be there in many times in order to negotiate a, a, a common uh, 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 kind of a. a Outcome and the final outcome was that uh, that uh, the the, uh, the countries decided to form a foundation, uh, and the first um, meeting with the foundation was held in uh, uh, 2012 in in Bangkok. So here you can see the speaker is wearing a tie. Uh, I uh, I was the, uh, 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 one of the founding members of the of the, of the board of of, uh, of the of the foundation. Uh, uh, in in 2015, the, all the uh, health ministers uh, got together in the, the, the uh, uh, sideline of the World Health Assembly in Geneva, and they signed a new new memorandum of, of understanding uh, on the on the on the new cooperation on the on the new foundation that uh, that that which which I uh, fortunately helped to 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 to, to start. Uh, now, finally, uh, for, uh, with respect to COVID, what, what is the situation in the Mekong countries? Uh, uh, these are all taken uh, from the worldometer, uh, and as you can see, that uh, the, the the situation is uh, uh, is quite good actually compared to many other countries, uh, and uh, the the cases per million population is is low. Uh, I mean, uh, China has fifty eight, Thailand Thailand uh, forty four. But but uh, if we compare it with uh, uh, Bangladesh, Bangladesh has about uh, uh, 245. So, so compared to that, uh, all all these uh, 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 countries are 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 doing well. They are also in terms of the deaths per million population. That's also low. I mean, uh, 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 
uh, uh, uh, China is comparable to what, what Bangladesh is today. It's the three, uh, three, uh, three deaths per million population. And also in terms of the, of the tests, you can see that uh, many of the countries have done large number of tests uh, um, uh, uh, compared to many other countries. Uh, so uh, the, the, the lower number of, 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 the, of the cases and the, and the, and the deaths uh, obviously cannot be fully attributed to, only to MBDS, uh, but there are many other factors. But, but I, can, I, can, I, can, I, 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 I dare to say that uh, the, the MBDS has played a good kind of uh, instrumental role in preparing these countries for, for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the pandemic. Uh, so, so that was uh, uh, about uh, the, the, the MBDS, and uh, there has been a lot of studies on, on uh, MBDS, and one of the external uh, evaluation sort of uh, uh, commented that uh, the MBDS is a social movement. And the, and the friendship, trust, and partnership built among the people involved are social capitals gained from MBDS. So that's a, that's a big kind of a, a, a kind of compliment to, 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 to MBDS. The other impact of MBDS is that uh, that uh, uh, following the MBDS model, uh, the, the, there are a number of other uh, 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 similar networks were started in different uh, other regions, including Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa, and also in the Middle East. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, the Middle East one is, 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 is quite, quite interesting in the sense that uh, the, the, the uh, uh, network is, is done between Jordan, uh, Palestine, and uh, Israel. So, so, so even though there are a lot of problems between socio, so the uh, geopolitical problems, uh, but, but, but uh, uh, despite that, the, the countries are, are kind of uh, 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 doing the surveillance uh, in, 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 in those situations. Uh, uh, so, 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 so that was uh, the MBDS. So when, when I was uh, uh, working on MBDS, I, I was sort of always used to ask myself why uh, we cannot do a similar thing in South Asia. Uh, and, and fortunately, I was able to uh, uh, support a, 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 a meeting uh, in, in, in India. Uh, and and uh, so, so what are the lessons for 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 for, for South Asia? And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we supported at that time was to start a uh, 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 or, or or do a workshop in uh, um, uh, Jorpaiguri district in, in West Bengal, uh, where uh, um, uh, many uh, sort of uh, experts on on health from Bangladesh. Uh, from India, um, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka attended. There was no Pakistani uh, 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 delegation there, unfortunately. Uh, but but the outcome of that was that uh, they decided to to sort of start a, uh, uh, a, a, a an alliance, a one health alliance for South Asia called and and it was coined OHASA, One Health Alliance for South Asia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't move further, and uh, uh, so and and, and he had a, it had a kind of a neonatal death. Uh, so 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 I I, I wonder uh, I, I still wonder why uh, we in South Asia have been so unsuccessful in taking this forward. Maybe Professor Nidish Devnath can can uh, tell us more about that. But but I can I can I can I can I I I, I, I can identify three reasons why the OHASA uh, thing uh, failed uh, to to to, to really, uh, take a root. Uh, one was that uh, that uh, the the uh, uh, the geopolitical situation. Uh, the, uh, the, you know the, the the enmity and and uh, uh, between the countries in this region. So that's that's one. The second thing is that uh, this this particular uh, meeting, which led to OHASA, was led by uh, people mostly from the uh, wildlife uh, area, and uh, there wasn't, in my opinion, much support from the human health people. So, 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 so there was a kind of a uh, uh, sort of uh, interprofessional kind of kind of rivalry there, 
Uh, and thirdly, that uh, there was no money available, or, or at, at least for, 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 for this particular thing. Uh, so, so, so because of uh, uh, these reasons, uh, the OHASA thing could not uh, sort of uh, move forward, uh, but which was, which was, which was uh, very, it, it was, uh, I, I was, I, I felt so bad about that. And I'm sure many of you will, will also. Uh, Uh, so, so I want to close by 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 uh, uh, paraphrasing Tagore. This is uh, for, from one of his very famous uh, uh, poem, uh, where he said, "Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, let my region awake." So that was from Tagore. And uh, and with these uh, 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 few words, uh, I, I I I thank. Thank you all again for this opportunity, and uh, I, I look forward to 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 to, to sort of uh, uh, hearing any 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 comments or questions you have. And again, Professor Devnath, thank you for inviting me to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it is an wonderful presentation, and you have explained the experience of this Mekong Basin this network. And we have a lot of questions basically now. I will go. I don't know how many questions can I really uh, put forward within this short time. But the first question with uh, uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, Dal Pfeiffer. Dal, there is several questions, but I can combine them. The COVID-19 association of animal. How confirmed is it? It is. Is it still in a sort of ambiguity? Is it a genetic disease or any other, you know, intermediate host link? Is, it's, I think four or five or more than that questions uh, uh, are there. Can you really focus on this area a little bit? Thank you. I, 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 I mean, we, we, we don't know. And uh, I've, I've, as I've said, I think I've, I've expressed that you to several media outlets that I don't think will ever be able to find out exactly what the mechanism was but we, we can safely assume that the it traces back to bats and uh, either then directly from bats to humans uh, through whatever mechanism or via an intermediate host but we don't know what that is so it is it is a zoonosis i think that's uh, uh, that there's really no doubt but what it is exactly is unclear and i fear will remain unclear and that's just disappointing because for prevention purposes uh, to, to prevent reoccurrence of such an event in the future of such an event in the future it would be useful to know what the mechanisms were um, unfortunate is also of course that when we have to admit that it'll be impossible to come up with 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 a definitive answer that it opens uh, up the opportunity for the development of conspiracy theories um, which will make it more difficult for everybody involved. So, there is, I mean, I can, one thing I can add, I mean, the, the question of the wet market, was it for wet markets, is, it seems very plausible. I would still argue it's very plausible. But there have been some recent reports where in the Chinese are saying that they couldn't, they sampled, apparently they had samples from that uh, uh, a market uh, from way back in, from the beginning of January and they couldn't find anything in animals, but they found uh, COVID in the environment. So the speculation being that the market might have been the amplifier. It's a bit similar, I guess, to what I showed on my slides, you see the amplification in the market. Um, anyway, okay. so, so the whole questions and answers. Yeah. Okay, Doug, uh, there is one question here with your own experience. Can you really rate uh, globally or regionally uh, the rate of preparedness and response to COVID-19, either from a, from a human health side or as a one health approach? What is your view uh, in terms of preparedness and response? Oh, uh, I mean, <laughs> that's a, I think it's a very important question, and I think we need to we need to look at, into that in a structured way once this is over. Um, because we need to learn how to do it better. My, 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 my impression is that, you know, it's subjective, uh, any, because I don't, 
there's not enough one knows usually about these countries and what the political economy was, for example, okay? And what the drivers were of specific decisions. So we get information from the media and then we might say, Sweden is doing a good job, okay? And then others are saying they're not. Um, uh, and uh, it's hard to evaluate whether that's true or not. Did Hong Kong do a good yeah, job? But, uh, I, this is a question to both of you. Yeah. I mean, this is one thing that we are uh, really posing here, that whether Southeast Asia or East Asia comparatively doing better, com you know, uh, globally. And is there any special reason? Here, you know, we saw this presentation from the uh, the way it's working. Can you really infer, both of you can share this thing, is there a special thing in that particular region doing better, Vietnam, even Thailand, and say, for example, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Korea, they are comparatively doing better than the other part of the world, even including the developed world. And here we can see the example of MBDS. Can you really relate something there culturally, socially, or whatever, whatever it is? Dark and Chaudhary to both. Dark star. Yeah. Shall, shall I go first? You okay. Uh, well, well. Uh, as 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 I showed in my slide, that that uh, we see. Uh, I mean, the 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 numbers in in Southeast Asia in the Mekong region is is much much better than many other regions, of course. Uh, and and why is that? Uh, uh, there, there are, I think there are a few few sort of uh, reasons that I can identify. One is that the the government uh, um, uh, the governments there were were, were very sort of uh, 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 resolute, very, very decisive. They decided that, that we have to do it and, and they did it, whether it is uh, closing the border or, or, or uh, 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 ensuring the, 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 the safe distancing and so on and so, and so forth. So, so the uh, resoluteness of the government, the, the, the decisive uh, character of the government uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to make it happen was one reason. The, the, the other reason is obviously the question of the preparedness. So, so, so they were much more prepared and they started the preparation much earlier than uh, 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 a country like us. So, uh, so, so in many, many countries like us actually lost a, a valuable three to four weeks uh, in, uh, uh, before we started and, and decided. Uh, and then also in, in our case, for example, there were a lot of indecisiveness, uh, a, a lot of ambiguity uh, of, of what we want to do. Uh, so, so, so uh, uh, I mean, if you can compare this, this two situation, you can, you can identify what, 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 uh, what, what went too well there and what went wrong uh, in this part of the world. Okay, uh, Dark. Ah, uh, I'm less enthusiastic. I mean, I'm le probably less optimistic in terms of this assessment, you know. I think we shouldn't jump to conclusions now. That's why I meant about immediate, medium to long-term and long-term imp impact. We need to f wait how these countries are looking, not just in terms of health, human health and COVID mortality, but also economically, mental health, okay, um, et cetera. And that will only come out in whatever, a couple of years time. The, the debt that they've uh, come up with, the unemployment rates, et cetera, okay, suicide rates, et cetera. So I think that to me is where the One Health, what the One Health approach has to be about. We need to think broader. And I don't have the answer, okay, because I'm just a veterinarian, just a veterinarian. And I look at these questions from my very narrow perspective. But I am not sure that we've done the right thing, okay? Um, by focusing too much on the immediate. And that's why I brought in the ethics, okay? Can you do something where you're basically accepting a certain number of deaths in the human population? Is that ethically acceptable? I'm not in a position to make these judgments. Um, and, and I think that's, what needs to be added to these, to the, to the development, or, 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 or that advice needs to be available. That, that those perspectives need to be available to those that are making the decisions. I, from my perspective, we've been too much about case counting. 
Okay, and it's not that straightforward. Um, depends on the public health systems that they have. It depends on the uh, ability to do surveillance. It depends on the number of tests that they are able to conduct. It depends on the density of the human population. There are lots of factors in there. So all I'm saying, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, and I want to look at it again maybe in a year's time or in two years' time. To, 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 to know what the longer term, medium to longer term effect, medium term, that is actually, uh, effects will be. Okay, so, assuming, uh, assuming that, uh, that uh, the South, Southeast Asian countries have done way, uh, better than, than others. Uh, well, another reason I think is the, is the amount of money they spend on health, uh, the, the investment in health. I mean, so if you look at the, uh, the GDP per, per capita, uh, uh, Proportion of, uh, of, of money spent uh, on, on health uh, is only 0.4% in Bangladesh com compared to 6% in Thailand. So, 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 so what, what, how much you can buy with, uh, uh, with this amount of money? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think that is an important factor. And that's where countries like, say, Germany or South Korea, they're doing better. But, but like I'm saying, if we think about what's important for society, we need to go beyond health. That's what I'm saying. One health needs to go beyond that. And, and I'm not the one, I'm not in a, I'm not the one who knows where it has to go. But, but yeah. the future of one health needs to be also about that. Yeah, this is the question, you know, there are a lot of questions in this slide. Oh, yeah. so this, you know, the presentation that you made, you have focused on the multidisciplinarity and also mm -hmm. Professor Choudhury has talked quite a lot about the uh, transboundary and this thing, you know, the trust, mm -hmm. transparency, a relationship and also a sort of um, a, a sort of practice. Is it really there or not? I mean, over the last 10, 20 years, we have been trying to push this thing under the One Health banner or whatever. Uh, is it really working at all globally, regionally, or country level? A good example. Can you share something like that? This interdisciplinary. I would argue it's better, okay? It's better than it was. And uh, SARS has made a difference, avian influenza has made a difference, so I, and the engagement of uh, international organizations, FAO and OIE locally, and the capacity building has made a difference. But, but it wasn't good enough for, um, I would argue, for COVID. But COVID is such a dramatic, has been such a dramatic impact and such a such a, uh, an enormous factor uh, in terms of what it did to um, the human populations and the, um, the governance and the, uh, I guess the responses and the media and so on. So I don't think that, that's what we weren't ready for. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't, I mean, nobody, isn't, isn't that, I mean, we've, We've had H7 and 9, we've had SARS, we've had H5N1, we had H5N8, what have you. We've had all these things. We had Ebola, we had Nipah virus, and still we weren't ready. And because nobody would have thought there could be something as big as this. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> that, that could happen. There right? were people who said it would come, but yes. nobody believed them. Um, because we're not good at, pre I mean, I often say, we're not good at prevention. Uh, once, yeah. once, once, once it's happened, then we react in various ways. But we're not good enough at prevention. We need to prevent better. And I think that's where the Mekong Initiative is really is an excellent example. Those partnerships working together, okay, and they're sharing information. They do. I mean, and, 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 and Professor Chagro has, has shown that they do. And, and I think it's an incredible achievement. We need more of that. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary? Can you comment on that? Mustak Chaudhary? Yes, on, on what? Okay, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Well, this interdisciplinary and cross-border partnership, uh, is it really working globally? Or can that really solve the problem like COVID-19? Is there any good example in, during this particular time? Uh, well, the, the interdisciplinarity is is not working, unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, particularly for the COVID uh, uh, situation. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so, 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 uh, but but uh, the the uh, uh, the the platforms that that is that you were talking about, uh, to some extent. Uh, 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 they are providing sort of uh, uh, information about 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 the about the, about the movement about the about the, about the 
as of sort of the 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 way the uh, the uh, uh, the infection the the uh, uh, covid 19 is moving uh, and, uh, and also gives an uh, sort of a, an, an opportunity to 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 study it more uh, on 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 uh, and and its impact at the at the at the local level so having something uh, in place in the six countries, as in the case of MBDS, uh, you have an opportunity to to uh, to really study the details and the and the, and the impact and and the and the and the outcomes uh, at the local level. Uh, but but as uh, uh, Professor Pfeiffer was saying, that that uh, uh, in order to really understand those impacts and the and the and the and the and the and the, and the contribution of different actors in this, we have to. Uh, wait uh, perhaps two to three years to, 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 to understand to have a kind of a unbiased uh, uh, sort of assessment of the of the role of different uh, sort of actors and different different people in this. Okay, and there is one similar question, but a little bit different. Uh, that is, during this pandemic period, uh, as Dutch has already mentioned, that in UK there is one system at least there is a, uh, a scientific advisor uh, this sort of partnership you know over the time we tried with the donor funded mm -hmm. project but it looks that you know with this present uh, experience as you have already mentioned uh, it is not working uh, uh, in that way the uh, way we are expecting why is that is it only because that it is do not dependent or we need to think a different way to develop this sort of system in the future or uh, during this crisis moment. So both I, mean, of I, I, yeah, I you would can... argue, I mean, countries need to accept the fact that that's good for them, okay? I mean, if that's donor, um, just donor dependent, I think then you could argue, I mean, they probably don't uh, see it as being useful and it's not only for emergencies. It's not just for emergencies. That the access to independent scientific advice is useful for policy development in general in the different government departments. And, and I, and actually, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. That to me is a key component of this whole question. Um, access to scientific advice, but it needs to be in a way that policymakers understand. Uh, and also that the scientists understand the needs of the policymakers. So that's something you have to practice, um, as I said in my presentation. And it has not been working. And, if, and I actually just thinking about China, I don't think it has worked in China. And that's where we really would have needed it. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, it didn't work. Maybe also because it's a very big country, you've got so many different layers of bureaucracy. And at the province level, it wasn't there. Was it there at the national level? Is there enough respect between scientists and the people in the state council? I don't know. Um, but these mechanisms need to work in situations like that. Uh, in the UK, we can see it quite openly and in the media. And we also see the bits that don't work <laughs> okay, or don't appear to work. But it is still good to see that they have, um, in the SAGE uh, committee, they have also behavioral economists, for example. Okay? who are involved in providing advice to government. So mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's the way forward. Yeah, I think I think Dot mentioned about sage in 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 the uh, uh, in the UK. There are two sages there. One is which is started by the by the government, and then there was an independent sage as well, uh, which 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 was kind of contradicted many of the things that the government was doing. Uh, but but uh, but uh, uh, it 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 was a kind of a, a, a sort of. A, very helpful way to to to, to understand and, and and take kind of uh, right decisions, uh, but but are we seeing similar kind of things in our part of the world? Uh, uh, perhaps not. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, uh, uh, I mean, as we said that the sage has the economist and and uh, all, all kinds of people there, uh, but but we don't have a similar kind of thing here. I mean, we, we have different coordination committees, but those are mostly from the government. Uh, uh, huge, huge sort of uh, 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 people outside the government, the civil society, the academics. Uh, uh, so, 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 how are they? Uh, so, so we, we, I mean, uh, we, we have a sort of a, a long way to go, uh, actually, in in in, in this direction. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Well, we love the Lord, but are we really learning or not? This is the issue uh, that because we can see this public health system in the country, as Dark and you also mentioned that, that it is only not the human health side, uh, the other partners need to be there. There is a question here, there is a need of multidisciplinary approach for dealing with present COVID. However, uh, there is not only lack of common understanding, but it also the degree of animosity exists between different stakeholders. How to really deal with this sort of situation? Because, uh, you know, public health, the common understanding is it is only the physician, only they will replay the role. But under this current situation, uh, how can you really overcome uh, this thing and what can you do in the future? Over to both of you. Well, I, th I think, um, uh, uh, Nitish, that you have a huge responsibility as, as the as the, the as one of the uh, uh, sort of uh, principal person for the One Health Bangladesh uh, movement. Uh, that 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 you have to get all these people together uh, and and start thinking of of how uh, how you cannot have a, a human health without looking at animal health. Uh, because because more than 70% of the uh, 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 newly emerging diseases are coming from the animals. So uh, how can you control uh, 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 or, or, or save humans by not looking at uh, with, without really sort of looking at the at the at the, at the, at the well-being of the of the animals and the, and the wildlife as well? Uh, so 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 we have. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, the, the the whole idea of One Health uh, has uh, hasn't been really uh, sort of uh, 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 circulated well, if I can call it. Uh, uh, not uh, sort of uh, it's, it's not much known. Uh, so we have a, a, a huge responsibility uh, to 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 really uh, work on this and and and. Uh, 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 make it more kind of kind of uh, acceptable to to all the people who are uh, stakeholders in this. Okay, Dan, do you think there is something to be changed in there? I mean, you, uh, clearly, I mean, it is, you've got a job to do there. That's, and I think you are doing. You are doing it anyway. I think you've done it. You you have done a lot already in Bangladesh, but uh, and it's not in other countries are behind a lot. So it's about in some ways you're also a lobbyist. Okay. So it needs a little bit of, it needs some lobbying from the community, from the scientific community. But in the end, though, it's about the politicians to accept that there's a need for it because they're the ones who make the decisions and decide on the budgets. Um, and so, and that, and I think what, what has to be, could also come in is international organizations like WHO and FAO uh, and OIE who need to push for it. And, uh, and, and maybe some regional initiative and some examples, okay? Some examples where it worked, um, such as, and I think you know, don't don't underestimate what you've achieved in Bangladesh. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, this this COVID uh, crisis has given uh, an opportunity, actually, uh, uh, when, uh, for a, for a, for a, for a new health system, uh, which which must uh, sort of encompass not only the human health but also uh, the 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 one health thing. So so. Uh, when we plan for the for the next health system, uh, we we have to work together and also make, as you say, that uh, the politicians uh, and also the donors themselves are uh, they're, they're also very sort of influential at some point, uh, just to, to to get everybody in order to really push the one health agenda. Right. So, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I just want to think it's an opportunity. It's a disaster, but also creates an opportunity. We need to use it. I mean, the bad bits Absolutely. are happening. There's nothing we can do it. So we need to make sure that it also provides an opportunity and we use it so that something better develops to, to, to protect us in the future to, when we have to deal with these kinds of things. You're very right there. Okay. Uh, we have a last question. You know, this is a common question we ask to all the uh, speakers. You know, this is the question that I am now presenting to you. Now, what is your experience, you know, with the, uh, this is a question to both of you, uh, the One Health practice that we have been uh, practicing over the last uh, more than a decade, I would say. And with this present situation and the disarray globally and uh, uh, all this painful experience, what do you think this One Health 
is it going to what? Is it going to die off or it has to come in a very different way? Uh, what is your comment on this one half? Two things, whether it is working or at all or not, is it going to die off or is it going to come up with a new shape? What is your view to both of you? No, it cannot die. It, it cannot die. As, as I said, that uh, that uh, I mean, this the 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 COVID has given the crisis has given an opportunity to uh, to, uh, to really move into uh, 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 a new model of 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 healthcare, which must include not only the human health but also the the the, the other things which which uh, sort of influence human health, uh, including the animals and the wildlife as well. Uh, so, 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 uh, 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 I think we have to uh, uh, we have to really push it in the in the uh, when 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 they when they for example in the in the uh, in the Bangladesh case uh, the 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 eight five year plan which is supposed to be launched uh, uh, soon uh, has been delayed because 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 they're they're uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, doing it all new because of the of this situation. So we have an opportunity really to influence. Uh, uh, the government and the policy makers to 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 uh, sort of have one health as as a as a kind of a model for 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 thinking about the future of, of health. So I I think very relevant that it will not die off. I think this has created the opportunity, and we'll just need to analyze or learn from what hasn't worked, and we'll come up with a model that's actually will be more effective. And I think the world is now more receptive. Towards the need for One Health, um, which is what, why it is actually an opportunity. Um, so, yep. Okay. Okay. I think <laughs> we have to come to the end. Uh, we have gone more than an hour. And uh, thank you very much. I think it is a very interesting uh, discussion we have. And thank you very much, all the participants. This is the highest number of participation, uh, although, uh, you know, over the last three times. And I can see so many, uh, you know, uh, participants from other part of the uh, world, not only from Bangladesh, from India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Middle East, even from some of the Western world. And uh, thanks to all of them. And I pay my uh, greatest, uh, uh, you know, gratitude to both the speakers. It's so elegant uh, presentation and also. Uh, the answer to the questions. I know there are some questions that I have not put forward because the time uh, is uh, short now, but I will put them to our uh, speakers. Maybe they will answer to you uh, in, a, in an email. And with this few word, we'll have another uh, webinar in next Friday, exactly in the same time that will be on uh, the testing uh, strategies, whether it is working or not. And with this few words, Dal and uh, Mr. Bai, uh, I uh, thank you so much on behalf of One Health Bangladesh as well as the global health development. With these few words, I want to conclude our today's session. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank All you. Right. Bye. 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 Bye, Dark.